What's up guys, it's Richie Rich back yet again and this time I'm bringing you a review of the hysterical laugh out loud feature film Life starring Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence Be sure to check this out So, Life from 1999, you know, as I mentioned, starring, uh, in my opinion, still, I still don't believe anyone can touch him. Uh, you know, what is it? Um, Dave Chappelle called him Caesar, you know, when he was doing that, um, uh, that ceremony to, you know, how, like, uh, obviously the great achievement of Eddie Murphy, you know, and uh, it's still in my book, still the, um, the total package of what a comedian is, you know, Eddie Murphy is that star, you know, and beside him, uh, appearing in this film is Martin Lawrence, you all know him best from the, uh, you know, 10 out of 10, uh, 90s TV series, hit TV series called Martin. So, like, we're speaking about, uh, Martin, uh, Martin specifically, I'll move on to, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Delirious after, um, after the Martin series had, um, ended in, uh, the late 90s, uh, Martin was one of the few stars of the, um, uh, you know, breakout, uh, of the TV sitcoms at that time, you know, to transcend and move on to feature films, you know, alongside, you know, was Will Smith, you know, and when I mention Will and Martin specifically is they successfully moved into film starring them like they were the leads you know Martin appeared in you know life he appeared in a great another very underrated classic um Blue Streak and uh, he appeared in you know Big Mama's House you know so Martin was getting films where regardless of what you want to review it as like if it was like corny or, you know, it wasn't like the caliber to like a Will Smith, like his blockbuster films. He still was treated as a lead, you know, he was on Hollywood's radar at that time. And I keep saying the night in the 90s, it was very difficult to be like, um, you know, a successful black lead without, you know, the other ones I mentioned, you know, like, uh, what was it? Samuel Jackson was there, uh, Morgan Freeman was there, you know, Danny Glover from Live a Weapon. And of course, you know, Mr. Um, a legend, you know, Denzel Washington, you know, so through the 90s, we saw like Will Smith and Martin Lawrence and later on, uh, Jamie Foxx blew up, you know, uh, Eddie Murphy was already a huge, huge uh, international star, you know, from the 80s, you know, but like, you know, that's why you've always got to really credit um, Def Comedy Jam, you know, because, you know, a lot of those stars that did break out that we are seeing, like, you know, after the 90s and even to this day, it came from Def Comedy Jam, and because Martin was hosting on, the, on that show, and he had his TV series, he became so notable during that time, you know, and obviously left a uh, big success hits such as this. So, like, Eddie Murphy was already a uh, huge, I mean, Eddie Murphy, to be honest, man, like, there's a clip on the Arsenio Hall show, if anyone checks this out, um, there's one where Michael Jackson the King of Pop, uh, they're both giving awards to each other. Uh, I mean, if Eddie Murphy gives it to Michael Jackson, as like, you know, basically to state that Michael Jackson is the king of all music and all entertainment. Then on the flip side, Michael Jackson gives an award to Eddie Murphy, saying he is the funniest man uh, who basically has ever lived, you know, in exist. And, you know, you cannot disagree with it, you know. Like I said, he, Eddie Murphy was before the Def Comedy Jam hit. So he was already a super, super star with these hits like, you know, Coming to America, Beverly Hills Cop, 48 Hours, you know, there's The Golden Child, you know, he, Eddie Murphy was the one, he, you know, of all the uh, comedians, you know, so even if you want to go back to like, you know, uh, Bill Cosby, not bringing him out, but 
what he's done. But Bill Cosby back in the day, Richard Pryor, Red Fox. Eddie Murphy was kind of the one who brought the comedy and made it kind of like into a superstar. You know, he was kind of like the like the Michael Jackson of comedy. You know, a anyone who knows anyone knows Eddie Murphy, man, because he was able to become more commercial with these films like coming to America, you know, like that is you go to anywhere across the globe, even like in igloos in Antarctica, they know who Eddie Murphy is from like this coming to America, you know, these big, big monstrous hits. But what happened was around like so around the early nineties, um, so he was already really, really big with like the Beverly Hills Cop and coming to America and like you know, the golden child. Around the early uh, 90s, he kind of had a dip with his kind of films, uh, you know, films like Box Office and Succession. You know, I think the first one that was a big flop was uh, Harlem Nights, you know, because kind of similar to this, which I'm going to go on more, it had a kind of like array of like noble black stars in that film. You know, Harlem Nights had Arsenio Hall, uh, Robin Harris, Eddie Murphy, uh, Tommy, who was in from Martin, I think even Red Fox appeared in it. So they did basically kind of like the format with which they did in like Coming to America, House Party, you know, in the Fridays, Friday films of putting like a stellar, stellar uh, film, stellar, 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 stellar actors, stellar black actors in one film to make this kind of monstrous hit. And it showed in films like Harlem Nights, you know, it didn't work, you know, it's a Harlem Nights flop. It was quickly followed by like Beverly Hills Cop 3, which like, you know, tanked, that bombed. And then there was these, he was kind of stuck in his run with like, he had like Vampire in Brooklyn. Boomerang was probably the one only good, um, you know, real like uh, gem of the, like, you know, the early 90s and that, you know. And what really saved him, you know, like kind of got Eddie Murphy, you know, back onto people's like, you know, okay, Eddie Murphy is the still super super cool comedian was the night professor film which happened in 1996 yeah you know and it's like a we with the night professor film it's a very important film because it was able to capture it was like Eddie Murphy was he kind of got lost with like the the films that were going because it kind of happens you know you have these like big big like super successful hits and to follow that up can be very difficult sometimes to hit a home run you know twice or you know three times or even twice can be very difficult you know and some people it's like you know they say in pro wrestling you know to get to the top is very difficult but to maintain it and stay there is the most hardest thing ever you know to make hit after hit after hit after hit you know not everyone's going to be jack nicholson you know what i mean so like it's a it's a very kind of difficult thing you know so like he, I believe after Boomerang, he took like a hiatus and then he came back with Night Professor, you know, and it was nice. With the Night Professor film, it's like it kind of brought Eddie Murphy into the 90s because with the earliest films, you're still bringing that 80s kind of humor, humor in. But in the 90s, you can kind of see the evolution of Eddie. Like how he appears in Night Professor is pretty much how uh, Eddie appears in this, you know, like how Buddy Love is in Night Professor, you know, like, you know, the charming fast talking like very very charismatic guy that's how um eddie is appeared in uh this film as a uh, ray i believe it's rayford gibson yeah and martin lawrence playing claude so like you know when you've got like the basically uh two funniest comedians at this time yeah because in the 90s um why i mentioned like eddie and martin as the funniest comedians they were like uh, the top tier because just imagine like martin's tv show just around that time was still, I don't care what anyone says, that was the top caliber, caliber um, uh, comedic uh, TV series, you know, even if you wanted to put it as all time, I would still say Martin is there, you know, and you've got Eddie Murphy who still sits on like the Mount Rushmore as one of the funniest comedians ever, combining them together, together was like something you never seen, you know, and it has that kind of um, similar trait that they did with Coming to America of like, you had like the, you know, the Eddie Murphy and the Arsenio, two like great, great superstars and you put them to give a duo, you know, so it has a lot of that kind of vibe of what we had so in coming to America. Life is, um, is, uh, is life, you know, it's a, 
it's a period piece, you know, like, um, so I did a, a couple while back, I did a view on like a uh, devil in a blue dress starring Denzel Washington. This is like, um, uh, probably like two decades just before that, you know, before the war, first world war, I believe, you know, so, you know, if you want to go back to the night, you know, the early 1900s, you know, how like African Americans, people who look like me were getting treated in that place is pretty much exposed in this film. So like, yeah, you know, how the story uh, begins is basically like they they get team, they basically come together, you know, from like, basically Martin Lawrence is, um, he's, has his, he's like, um, what, trying to, he's basically got a job as like a banker in like New York City, you know, and he's got his girl played by Sanafa Laffan, you know, the hot girl who plays Marvel, that's always I remember, she was always with Out of Time with Denzel Washington, you know, she's, uh, basically there, he, he's basically got a plan, like he's gonna get this job, He's got his girl, who the girl is enough for laughing. She's trying to push him, you know, marriage and babies and that. But for the time being, it looks like everything's stable. And that's, you know, my nose playing Claude. On the other side, Eddie Murphy's playing Ray. He's basically just like a con artist, you know. He basically hustles, hustles, you know. He like pass. He was like, you know, give people hugs and like, you know, try and, you know, teeth their wallet. You know what I mean? So he's involved in that. No, um... You know the shady kind of business and that you know so what ends up happening is like you know they end up meeting in one bar one night and basically because um you know eddie murphy's like steals his wallet um one of the guys who <laughs> you some of the people i remember when i watched this the first time i never even knew who this was uh rick james i'm rick james you know from you know paid in the chevelle show he appears in this as a, i believe it's called spanky you know and Eddie, uh, Eddie Murphy has, uh, Eddie Murphy playing, um, Ray, he's had, like, um, you know, he's had kind of worked with him before, you know, as, like, he's, because he's a hustler, you know, so, basically, he owes him money, but Spanky is able, Sp Spanky's gonna give him, like, one more chance to, like, you know, redeem himself, so he basically sends, like, you know, Martin, uh, Martin, Ray and Claude to go to the, basically, the furthest down of uh, Mississippi, and they basically got these kind of booze, that they're gonna deliver, you know, to sell because yeah, at this time again for a African American to get like you know some sustainable income was very difficult because you were denied because at that time you were treated lower than dirt, you know, even the you know rodents were treated better than black people, you know, so like even to just to like cut it off like uh, the scene when they're going to um, uh, <laughs> the Mississippi, they walk into a cafe and it's only white people <laughs> and anyway mm -hmm. when they both were working, Ray and Claude were working in yeah Claude's just like oh you know got a long journey we hungry yeah and the lady's like this is only white only pies you know and you know Ray already got he already gets to like feeling like yeah you know we're not one there you know we should go but he does this kind of thing he says what will it take to turn them white only pies to pies for us, you know, <laughs> and she says, how about I turn y'all into pies, you know, and it, Ray's just like, okay, so you want us to go down there, you know, so he had a big sign that said, you know, no colored people allowed, you know, so it just showed at that time to, you know, the system, it, you know, if you really want to talk about the whole, the essence of racism, like, where it is the system never worked for, you, you know, what I mean, justice never existed. You know, and to suffer all those years for that is a big, big, uh, you know, is atrocious. So that's why they had to do these kind of stuff, you know, like bootlegging, um, you know, booze, you know, working kind of underground, you know, because if they worked on the surface, hey, guess what? We can put a sign that's just saying why only and what can you do, you know, if all the police and the, all the justice system are Caucasians. Well, you know, you're done. Like, you know, they make their way to, um, uh, you know, Mississippi and they get to, uh, you know, dude, they were going to deliver the uh, booze to his name Slim, which is not Slim, he's actually a, a <laughs> rather rotund person and that. And so once they deliver the booze, you know, mission accomplished, uh, you know, Ray is basically like, you know, we should go because they see like a, like a nightclub, you know, because I'm basically like after that, that whole journey, you know, and basically like, you know, them together, he's like, you know what? We made like our destination, 
let's go celebrate, you know, and like Claude's reluctant at the first, but then after he joins it, he says, you know what, let's just join. And when they get to this, like, uh, you know, this little club, uh, basically Ray is um, on the, uh, he's playing like a poker, you know, basically just because he's a hustler, you know, he's trying to win more dough. And then Claude, he's on the, um, the bar table and there's a waitress the waitress just so happens to be you know the hot girl who is in um uh jason's lyric the uh, jason's lyric uh, lisa nicole carson and <laughs> you know he's uh and remember she also played the devil in a blue dress you know so she was always appearing in these films as like that you know hot hot like you know chunky uh, you know, <laughs> Ebony Chick, you know, so kind of similar what, you know, Lisa Nicole Carson is in Double Blue Dress. She basically does, you know, her role is very short. It's even shorter in this than Double in a Blue Dress. In here, she's very similar without too much like, um, you know, dialogue or speech. Just with the way her eyes is and that, very, very seductive, you know, and Martin playing uh, Claude, he fools for it. He fools for it, you know. They basically like uh, she just basically buys two drinks and says, you know, like mine, you know, playing uh, Ray, uh, playing Claude, sorry, uh, you know, to buy the drinks and uh, and she they're all laughing like, huh, oh, my name's Claude, Claude, and she's just like, you got any money, Claude? You know, <laughs> straight away. And you know what's this leading? You know, the last money they had, which was basically to go back and get back to Spanky. You know, tell him that we, you know, we we succeeded in the mission, you know, we gave the booze and that, you know, he gave the last two dollars to her, you know, just to have some, you know, God's work, as they call it, you know, and that. And meanwhile, Ray, he got um, basically hustled, like the whole my hustler got hustled, you know, he was playing it with um, the guy called Winston, you know, I don't know, particularly know the actor's name. He was basically uh, using one of the waitresses to like hide cards in to think I'm not like the best understanding of like how poker works but he was basically cheating like kind of under the table the waitress gets on playing cards and that so in one moment when Eddie thought he got like a roll kind of flush I hope that's right you know to like clear him out of the table because he actually um, there's like a watch that he actually got passed down from his daddy so he didn't have any money to like have the same kind of uh, bet with Winston so he like puts his dad's watch on the table and because like he you know he didn't know till later to Winston uh you know he runs out of the you know club that he was cheating so like basically uh you know Martin losing all of his money and then Eddie Murphy's losing his money it's like you know you basically think like the night could not get any more worse what happens is once they you know they leave the, the bar uh basically you know the guy who stole the guy basically stole you know eddie's watch you know he had some problems with like the uh, the sheriff in time you know moi you know the you know the white uh yeah the white uh, police uh, system and that so he has an altercation with them and he ends up getting slain and when eddie and mine are coming out of the bar you know they walk in like down the street and they basically basically get pushed winston like onto him and you know it's covered with like you know, fatal fatal wounds goes onto Martin's top you know even though Eddie is able to retrieve the watch in a way they basically get framed you know so when the you know um the like the members of like you know Mississippi they find Eddie they find basically two black guys with a dead body you know and like you know like we've already holding the watch and that uh, they basically think they committed like you know homicide yeah so like i remember like they get sent to the uh they get sent to the jail and like you know just that evil you know if you want to call it the man you know what i mean he comes to the once like claude and ray are in the uh, cell you know and like the guy who actually did um you know uh, kill um uh what's his name winston um you know he you know confronts like ray and claude and he's like well if y'all didn't commit it, you ain't got nothing to worry about. It was this kind of just like, you know, like you were just looking through some like the heart of like a demon. Like he's the one who did it and he had no problem looking them in face to face 
and say, hey, man, you know, if you get life, man, it's no big deal, you know, I'm free, you know, it, it was, it was just some monstrous behavior, you know, and the scene just cuts and the judge goes, life, you know, and they're fighting, like, how do you mean life, man, this bullshit, are you going, are you going, are you going, going, you know, so yeah, like, where the film really picks up, because where is, where the film's really mostly, um, uh, like, spends the majority of his time is the penitentiary, you know, they get sent to, like, the east of, you know, the Mississippi, uh, prison you know and basically they're sent with like a whole inclusion of only black <laughs> there's only black people who are the inmates in there you know you have um bernie max playing jingling 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 god rest his soul uh michael arnage jr a lot of people know him from he's from a uh, juan man and he gets spot in the fruit times as a uh, fruit get, he did a few guest spots in martin pretty ricky that's what they call it yeah you know you remember that um uh, Anthony Anderson appears in this as well. Um, there's a few. There's a few other ones that um, a few other ones I know. I know they've appeared like in a few of other the United films and the um, you know movies that are around that time. You know, but um, like it's a very very big cast. You know, when you see like who's in the uh, you know Mississippi prison. Yeah, where where is really where where is really um touching with this film is it blends like a you know, real life drama and tragedy into comedy, you know, because one could only imagine having to spend life in prison for uh, yeah, a nothing that you had nothing to do with, right? you know what I mean, false, you know, accusations, you know, you know what I mean, but where the comedy, where the comedic side happens is when they're all around together, you know, all these inmates, you know, they even joke about like who did the most rotten uh crime to get in jail you know one killed santa one said they one said he had his uh he had a half sister so he cut in half you know and ray and claude went so they said they went on kind of this rampage of like you know cause they, were, <laughs> they said they couldn't claude and ray so they used to just go on some like mad killing spree and that you know they were they were lying you know they were innocent you know and there's that great scene it's like maybe i'll eat your cornbread you know, but it's just, it's just from, from the moment again to the penitentiary, just, just, just this mad comedic humor, and you gotta really tribute, um, Eddie Murphy, because, you know, I, I think someone even mentioned this before, like, you can kind of see how some of these black comedians now are basically using Eddie Murphy in film, you know, if you kind of see how Chris Tuck is in Rush Hour, that's kind of like an homage to how you see Eddie Murphy because Eddie Murphy to me was the first one who was that fast talking uh slapstick humor you know kind of being like he was he he was very like uh, he knows what he's doing but he doesn't know what he's doing you know and he was always the one to get you know hit or beaten up like he gets beaten up by the big dude you know he always gets beaten up by the wooden you know, you know what I mean, so it's like he invented that kind of like, um, act, acting style, you know, and it's like you saw like, um, Chris Tucker in Rush Hour, you know, how Chris Rock was in his, um, film, when it's like, you know, head of state and down to earth, you know, you know, even, even like, uh, even like, not Chappelle too much, you know, Chappelle's got his kind of different one, but even if you were to say Kevin Hart to this day, they all borrowed traits of Eddie Murphy, and it is nice, you know, because, how Eddie is in this, like this, Eddie in a weird way, he kind of plays how Martin is in the Martin show, you know what I mean, just this arrogant, jumping to conclusion, not really thinking stuff through, that's how Eddie is in this, you know, to the max, you know, if you thought Buddy Love was crazy, like how he is in this, he's just, like, that. Martin is kind of more of the sensible one, you know, he's very different how he is in TV show, you know, how Claude is, you know, He's more of a sensible approach, you know, he just wants to take that steady way, you know. But this is where, it, it, like, Claude, um, sorry, Ray has got kind of the, um, you know, he's already seen stuff way more because he's been, like, in, how can I say, he's more underground than how Martin is. Martin is always in this, like, the system will work, the system will work. You know, I got a job that starts on Monday, you know what I mean? So he's just willing to be like, you know, the time will come, we'll eventually get out. And Ed is like, Bruh, this is never gonna happen, you know. We've gotta find a scheme to basically get us out here, you know. Eddie Murphy he tries one scene, he tries picking up a copter, a, um, a plane, he tries flying up to go to New York City and it like it crashes back down 
and even one scene he goes with mine and he a map he drew himself <laughs> to try and escape out of the uh, penitentiary you know so the whole time he's trying to escape you know and um you know he somehow drags uh you know, uh, um, Claude, you know, mine into, into the, you know, into his, like, uh, kind of plans, you know, and it's like, for every, like, mishap and mishap, you know, they basically eventually get to this conclusion, like, man, you know, they gave us life, I guess we're going to spend life in prison. And what I forgot to mention is, um, Heavy D, you know, great rapper from the 90s, um, because how he's told at the start is, um, it's kind of like, uh, the, the story is being told from uh, one of uh, one of the guys that uh, you know who was spending time in prison with uh, um, Claude and Ray. You know he's like you know in his like uh, I believe he's in his nineties at the end. So he's speaking it to two inmates as they're kind of digging um, uh, the graves of supposedly Ray and Claude. You know so it's like um, it's it's not a series of flashbacks. It just tells like the whole stories from the early nineties. In the early 1900s, early 1900s, early 1930s to when they eventually, uh, you know, near the climax, which is like the, I believe it's the 70s to the 90s and that, because I believe they almost spent like 50, 60 years, which is a damn long time, you know, especially for something that you didn't do. So, and also like, uh, um, Pukim Woodbine, you know, he, very, very underrated actor, you know, he appeared in, um, Jason's lyric, you know, as like, you know, the very, very chaotic brother, you know, he appears in this as can't get right, you know, and he, he, again, he's seen as in this, like, like how the duration he appears in this is very uh, small or very significant, you know, he, <laughs> one of the most brilliant standout comedic moments from this film uh, was basically can't get right, he gets one of the, um, I believe he's the chief who kind of like probably owns the whole penitentiary. They have a daughter, a white, blue eyed, the typical to Becky, if you be honest, call it Becky, if you want to call it Becky. It's a white girl, you know. She, they see her when she's young, when she puts like, you know, Claude and Ray in the hole. She's like, put them in the hole, you know. So she grows up into this kind of like, you know, um, uh, Disney kind of princess, you know. And when Cotton get right, sees her, he's like, you know. They automatically get, he, like, he's feeling her, and the white girl's got jungle fever. So somewhere in, like, when, you know, like, when everyone, maybe at, like, dusk or something, those two go on, and, <laughs> and basically because, and this is where I had to mention this, the, the, the girl, the, um, Caucasian girl, she already had a man. She, she had, like, a, a my husband, you know, they, you see them kissing when she first arrives. You know what I mean? Because all the uh, penitentiaries, you know, Eddie Murphy, Anthony Anderson, and Martin Lawrence, I think they're doing some work on this kind of like, um, um, I think it's like this kind of like a uh, brick, small kind of like uh, house or something. And, you know, they see her drive by, you know, with her husband, and Anthony Anderson's like, oh, that girl's got a game. You know, when you see her with her husband, she was, she basically, you know, behind his back was cheating with can't get right. You know, she really, really wanted BBC, you know, <laughs> and I'm not talking about this channel, you know. So when she actually gets pregnant, everyone around it thinks it's the, the husband, the white Mississippi boy, you know, and it's a fantastic scene when it's like, it's a big end. And the boy is fine. And then when you see the dad of that white girl come in and he screams. Then the next king is like, I want every Jacobo black person to come like that. You know, so he knew it was one of the inmates, but obviously he couldn't tell because at that time paternity tests obviously didn't exist, you know, like you know, I mean checking like whose kid is real. So he tried to kinda like, you know, put the mixed race child, the biracial child to each of the inmates, inmates, uh, you know, face to kind of match it, you know, and then what happens is everyone, <laughs> uh, Eddie and all, uh, Eddie Martin and Buddy Mag, they all come and say, that child belongs to me, anyone could see that child is mine, I'm that daddy's, I'm that boy's baby, I'm that boy's baby daddy, then Buddy Mag lastly comes, he goes, I'm his baby, <laughs> and then the whole, the whole, uh, basically even the, um, even the, um, uh, the warden, you know, who always gave, like, Ray and Claude a bad time, he even found it funny, you know what I mean, because 
you know, um, how can he like uh, have that whole? He basically owned that whole place, and he and somehow an inmate got his white Caucasian daughter pregnant, and obviously, how are you gonna do anything? You know, that's basically carrying your blood. You know what I mean? So it's just a nice like a uh, kind of karma, you know, to stick it to the man. And you know, and while I touch on that point, you know, it's like um, for someone who has been, uh, you know, cheated on. Um, that kind of stuff is really, you know, you know, even though obviously it's a comedic film, you know, that kind of stuff happens uh, on a, you know, I'm saying monthly basis. That's an everyday basis, you know. I've even had like, you know, folks who are older than me who are within my kind of family, like aunties and uncle, who have done that. You know, what I mean, like basically, you know, obviously this one it helps because it's very easy to just think, you know, she had a biracial kid, she must have obviously been with a black man, but when it's like two of the same races and, you know, you have the baby, but while she, like even before she was pregnant, but she was with you, she was with Tom, Dick and Harry, but then she was saying it was you, then it's like you have the baby and then like it probably gets to a stage when they're already in their teens or older and you find out you're not like, you're not the genuine like actual bloodstream, uh, you know, like they're not your offspring. That's like the worst thing ever to do, man. Like that kind of like, you know, fraud, you know, even though like the woman knows, the woman knows who's the one who got her knocked up. She'll be lying to the guy because probably the guy's madly in love with uh, the woman. You know, so it's just a thing, you know, even for me, for future reference, man, like, anytime I'm with a chick now, it's just to be fully, like, um, you know, checking, screening them, you know what I mean? Like I said, some, and it's happened to me sometimes when, like, these chicks are talking, it's not all of them, but majority of times, they'll be talking to you and saying, like, they're with you, with you, and that, but you got, you got do your background checks, man. You never know. They're talking to you and they could be talking to two other people telling the same exact story. So, like, yeah, I, you know, I, I would really, really go into the story that much, but I kind of don't want to spoil it for people who have not seen this film, you know. That's why I'm touching on, you know, the various main parts of this story, you know, because I think anyone who is a fan of uh, that comedy, you know, I'm talking about that raw comedy, like what was presented in Martin and Eddie Murphy and then stand up tours, you know, he did like with Delirious and, you know, all those great films like even Boomerang of them black um, actors coming together to make this super duper film. They have to check this film out. But um, moving on, like where the film ends up going is like basically, you know, basically the only ones who would survive is Ray, Claude, you know, Eddie and Martin. They're the only one who make it to the end. They get to near the part where uh, important scene is where um, I remember uh, Martin Lawrence's great scene like where he's looking at how they win the phrase and now they come into the 70s and Martin shows like you know he looks in the car window and it shows like you know how he's you know time's gone with him time's you know got a hold of him and he basically sees the guy who basically framed him you know the race you know the racist cop who really murdered that guy but he pinned it on Eddie and Martin he sees him you know because he remembers the scar that Winston left on his cheek you know and one time uh, they're basically in the uh, woods because basically Eddie and Martin they're still in the penitentiary but they get I wouldn't say it's parole they get sent to work with this um, uh, man you know so basically like he's kind of like uh, uh, if you want to call it chaperone you know they would drive him around they would cut the leaves, you know, prepare food for him. So he takes them out to the woods with time with that, you know, that racist sheriff and that, and, you know, they, and he finds out that because he basically blurts it out because he, he took, um, you know, a Ray's watch, you know, that is passed down from his dad. And, you know, uh, he basically says like, what was it? At least the Mississippi Penitentiary got four years of cheap labor, you know, and Ray and Claude are just about to shoot him and, you know, the guy who basically took you know, kind of custody of Ray and Claude, he ends up shooting that, you know, racist cop, you know what I mean, and you would say justice is served, you know, like they were gonna, you know, finally get released, but what happens is, as soon as, like, they find out, you know what I mean, like, as soon as I can find out, he actually passes the way when he goes to the restroom and that, so I think they're at, like, 60s and 70s, they end up staying for another 20 years, 
till night, so they're around in the 90s. And where like he kind of concludes, and he concludes well, is near the uh, basically near the, uh, the climax of the film. Um, Ray says he still got one last scheme, you know, this will be the scheme to get us out forever, you know. So, you know, one night they're going into, I believe, because they're in this hospital now, you know, still inmates, but it's in this kind of like hospital, you know, for people at that age. And he goes in because it's starting to burn down one night, it's being put to flames, but Claude's already in there. So Ray comes in, he's like, Claude, Claude. So he goes in to try and save him. And the whole place crashes down. Next morning, the whole place is in ruins. You know, then it moves to that present day, where you say Heavy D and the other uh, black dude, you know, they're digging up the graves of who is supposedly meant to be Ray and Claude. We then go on to find out that, um, you know, Ray, the night before, you know, the flames were burning down that, um, you know, that hospital where, that uh, area in the hospital zone. Ray and Claude had switched the body bags, you know, so they had already put, <laughs> they had already put some uh, bodies that were not with us in their body bags, you know, so they didn't even check it because everyone got burnt. And meanwhile, Ray and Claude finally escaped. They finally made it out of there, you know, and it's the, it's still just a great moment because you know, imagine like almost half of your life you spent in prison. They finally go out the end, and even though like they're in basically like like the last chapters in their life, you know, they end up going to the uh, stadium. I think it was the Yankee baseball stadium you know, to watch the game. And even if they're on like you know basically the last chapter in their life, there's just just this great, um, you know, heartwarming feeling that you know they they end up doing it. You know, they 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 made it out. You know, like the system said that they were meant to, you know, you know die and rot in that prison and they made it out so they were able to beat the system that you know had held them down for all those years you know so it's a it's a great you know triumph of a film for some for a film that's very comedic you know it's it, it does have its dark areas you know and i'll allude to this more more yeah because you know even though obviously this is like a you know story that was just created you, you cannot tell me this didn't happen to maybe hundreds or maybe thousands of uh, black uh, people that were, um, you know, that generation, you know, of that time just getting framed for like something they didn't do. And then, you know, when it came down to it, they got life in prison, you know, because even when you go to the penitentiary, it's only black people as inmates, you know, they were kind of like it was like the, a modern day slavery for that time because. They were in prison, but they were still working, basic kind of slaves, you know, getting told when to shower, getting told when to eat, getting told when to sleep, you know, and the next day you're going to work, 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 you know, and, you know, it's for them, like, who, for them, Ray and Claude, who were completely innocent, who were just kind of like, just trying to get by, you know, minding their own business, you know, to have to deal with that for 50 years, you know, and we all know that there's brothers, you know, you know what I mean, who had to, you know, deal with that, you know, it's like, um, it's just a great moment and a victory that they made it at the end. But yeah, man, the soundtrack on this, um, it was actually, um, I heard it was performed by uh, Wycliffe Jean, you know, Wycliffe, Wycliffe who was in the, uh, you know, the Fugees with uh, Lauren Hill, you know, he used to have that band in the 90s, you know, and he does like a lot of that kind of I think it's soul music, you know, like a, a, a bit of like R&B, but it's more of that soul, kind of like what Erica Badu does, you know, so it's more of that. I really wish there was more of them kind of music more today, you know, it's just like so dominated by, dominated by blah, 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 the mumble rap, you know, generation, but it was like they brought that, he brought that kind of soul into, uh, you know, his music, you know, and, um, and there's a bit of that reggae as well, you know, so he was a very, very diverse musical artist, you know, and um, the tune that's very, very great and that stands out in this is the, um, is a uh, New Day. Mama, I'll tell you, I want to be your man. I say, yeah, I don't know the lyrics, but it's a very, very touching scene. It, the whilst I'm re-included in prison, it shows a montage of basically like kind of the civil rights kind of movement and all the black, um, noble kind of um, 
breakouts that happen, you know, it shows like Martin Luther King, it shows Muhammad Ali, it shows like Malcolm X in this black and white montage, you know, like what was going on in America, you know, like, you know, John F. Kennedy, you know, trying to fight, you know, John F. Kennedy trying to team up with Martin Luther King to get, you know, civil rights, you know, it shows like, um, you know, the first shuttle getting lifted off, you know, so it shows that period from like basically, yeah, the, the 40s to the 70s, like about like 20, a span of 20 to 30 years of what was going on and that fight for, you know, equal opportunities and that, and it's just a, it's just a great one to see, you know, I could, you know, just to speak about like Richie Rich, you know, I've had my own shares of difficulties and hardships, man, I'm talking about, you know, yeah, if I gotta be real, I'll touch on anything, I'll talk about like, even making me emotional now, man, you know, I'm talking about like, you know, getting mad, mad bullied in, like, school, you know what I mean, and it wasn't even a race issue, just because I was different, you know, getting mad, mad bullied in school, you know, finding that the woman you love more than anything was, uh, I don't even want to say, but, you know, was just messing around behind your back, you know, doing job after job after job after job, hoping in one day to become, you guess they're rich, man. You know, the hardships that I've gone through is still nothing to be compared to what, you know, I would say, you know, my pre-generation before my brothers and sisters had to, you know, suffer in like America, you know, so, you know, it's like, um, yeah, I talked about this when I, you know, talked about Malcolm X, you know, it's like, I always say like what I've gone through up to this point is nothing compared to them, you know. And that always gives me motivation to kind of do the, do what is needed to get done, you know, like, you know, to accomplish all my, you know, dreams that I've set out to, you know, goals that I've got to achieve and targets I've got to get to, you know, it always gives me more kind of like courage, like I'm like, you know what, Though these I went to, uh, you know, like I was just showing this, these were, went to stores or like a cafe. And it said like, well, your kind is not allowed in, you know, I mean, a restriction. So obviously we don't have that anymore. So I've got to try to take more advantage of this opportunity. You know what I mean? It's, it's not even just, it's like, I take that for like those ones, like who were, you know, put in prison or like accused of something that they didn't do. And then they had to pay the armor price of like either life in prison or, you know, life in the other world, as it's in Dragon Ball Z, just because the justice system was completely, you know, far-fetched, you know, so it's like, yeah, I always make it like a, like a new day, as widely. Gene says to, like, make sure that, like, yeah, when I'm making strides, you know, it's for, I'm doing it for them, you know, like, I'm not only getting rich for me, I'm getting rich for, you know, like, you know, the Malcolm X's, I'm getting rich for my little King, I'm getting rich for, Muhammad Ali, you know, I want to see like it's just a generation prosper, you know what I mean, so that's, that's where, that's where it's very like, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, more, you know, towards me, so yeah, man, as I mentioned, man, like, um, even to go back, like, we, I would, um, this was one of the films I actually was watching in the 90s, you know, like, um, there was a time before that there used to be a place called Blockbuster, yeah, you know, I remember, I'm actually search, if I can find that Blockbuster card, I will, be reading it on here, you know, but, um, yeah, um, we used to get, me and siblings, we used to get taken to Blockbuster, like, every Friday night, and we used to watch this, um, Coming to America, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, and, um, you know, Night Professor, you know, like, big, big, big Eddie Murphy fans, you know what I mean, so we used to watch this, I think Life was the one we always, uh, borrowed out the most, you know, and, yeah, it's funny because as hysterical and, funny it was then even now watching this almost because this is like literally 20 20th anniversary of this film you know it's the jokes never lose a step man it's as funny as it was then and it's now and i feel it's very underrated you know like a lot of people you know obviously when they talk about the funniest movies you know i've said it like friday is definitely out there and the first house party is there life is a very very um equally if not if not even a uh, better film than those two, you know, you know, I mean, they, those films are really 
good, you know what I mean? But like the subject matter is dealing with this because um, even though, like I said, it's a, it's a fiction story. It's based on a lot of like, you know, you know, this was happening during this time, you know, and it's like, um, you know, this is 20 years anniversary, you know, like there should be some 20 year like Blu-ray, um, you know, cinematic release, you know, to, to this film, you know, or like even like if there was like, um, not even a sequel, but like it would be nice to see these characters appear. I would love to see Eddie Murphy and mine, you know, I know mine's um, going to be working with Paul Smith again in Bad Boys. Um, uh, free, you know, wonder how that would go, but, um, they did say they was going to make a coming to America too, but it'd be nice, like, um, because, you know, with these sequels as well, you know, when they take, like, a long time, you know, after, you know, I mean, like, Bad Boys 2 felt it already ended, where it needed to do to make a third one, sometimes just feels like a cash grab, you know what I mean, same with, like, the coming to America, but it would be nice, like, it doesn't have to be life specifically, but it'd be a cool thing just to see, you know, as this is brilliant, you know, Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence appear, you know, together on the uh, silver screen one more time, you know, uh, I would, I would definitely sign up for that. So yes, sir, that's my review on life, you know, an A-star quality uh, comedy uh, film, you know, um, if, if, like I said, if anyone is a fan of Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence in their prime, you know, this is a must, must uh, watch film, you know, and honestly, if everyone's like just a fan of like uh, the period pieces, you know, you know, of like black people, black people's kind of struggle, you know, in the early kind of 1900s, you know, like this is definitely a film that would, would they would definitely uh, love this kind of flavor and that. And to the people who have seen this film, you know, let me know, like, do you agree with, like, what I kind of um, say, you know, do you film like, um, this film? Because for me, I feel like it's a very, very underrated film, you know, very, very underrated film, you know. I don't know if not many people know about life, you know, because everyone knows about Night Professor, but they don't know too much about, you know, uh, life, you know. So, yeah, man, like, what did you think of, like, you know, the duo, you know, Eddie and mine together and that, and yeah, do you think it, needs a sequel, like just another film of Eddie and Martin together, you know, please let me know, man, and obviously stay tuned because I'm going to be doing another, of course, review from the 90s, which guess what, it's going to be coming very, very soon, but when that fateful day arrives, I assure you, Richie Rich will be back yet again. To yet. Peace to fingers.